financial markets in turmoil. What are the root causes of the financial crisis? The dollar losing value. Heading for its biggest loss in nearly three decades. Will Social Security even be there? I don't know. Buy or rent? That's a very good question. Interest rates? I'm not so sure. Where do you put your money? I don't know. Welcome to the show that answers your questions. This is Follow the Money Weekly with your host, economist, and best selling author. Here's Jerry Robinson. Hi, friends. Welcome to you all around the world. Welcome to Follow the Money Radio. So grateful to have you here along for the ride. We got a good show today. It, this is episode number 398. So we're getting really close to episode number 400. Might have to do something special that day. Maybe do a big giveaway or something. Let me know what you think by uh, shooting us an email or contact us by followthemoney.com forward slash contact. Let us know what we should do for our 400th episode. Maybe give away $400 worth of silver or $400 worth of gold or $400 worth of Bitcoin. Let us know. So today's episode is entitled Hard Asset Investing 101. And so on today's episode, I want to talk to you about hard asset investing. And I'm sure you've heard the phrase hard assets, right? You've certainly heard of that before. And today I want to explain what it means what are hard assets? I want to talk about that, and we'll also provide many examples of hard assets. And then I also want to discuss the benefits of owning hard assets in your portfolio, why you should include them in your investment portfolio. And then later on the show, we're going to be joined by our good friend, longtime sponsor, uh, Tom Cloud, who specializes in hard assets. He will be here to share a really interesting update on a brand new way to invest in hard assets. So let's just begin by asking the basic question, what are hard assets? So as an investor, over time, your goal is to accumulate assets, right, that rise in value. And you do this by trading your current purchasing power for these assets, which tend to at least hold, if not increase, the value of that purchasing power over the course of your life. And in the world of finance, there are different types of assets that you can own. So let's begin, before we define hard assets, let's define the word asset. What is an asset? Well, when you look up the etymology of the word, it's an old, actually comes from Latin, and then it goes down to the old French and Anglo-Norman French, where it basically means enough or a sufficient estate to take care of a debt, right? So in other words, it's going to be something that's going to be a resource for you. It's going to be a, re it's resourceful. And what an asset is really is a resource that is owned by an individual or some other entity that provides current, future, or some other type of potential benefit. If we really want to simplify it, we would just say that an asset is something of value that you own. So when an accountant draws up a balance sheet, they begin by making a list based on two categories, assets and liabilities. In this case, assets are those things of value that you own. And of course, the liabilities are the financial obligations, such as the debts that you may owe. Now, in accounting, there are many different types or categories of assets. They include current assets, fixed assets, operating assets, many others. However, for our purposes today, I just want to focus in on what we've been talking about, and that is hard assets. So let's really drill down now. What are hard assets? Now that we know what assets are, how they're different from liabilities, Simply put, hard assets are tangible assets, tangible assets. Now, the word tangible means to be perceptible by touch or discernible by touch. So put simply, a hard asset is something that is possible to touch with your hands. They are assets that have a physical form. They are palpable. They're concrete in that they are capable of being handled, touched, or felt. That is, they are something that is physical in nature, and it is from this physical nature that they derive their value. That is, hard assets have intrinsic value. So at this point, you may be wondering if some assets are considered to be hard, are there some that are considered to be soft? And the answer is yes. Just as a hard asset is something tangible or physical in nature, a soft asset is something that is intangible, right, or non-physical. So if we're thinking about it in terms of accounting, or we think about it in terms of maybe a business that you own, those would include things like the goodwill towards your company or the recognition of your brand, right? Think about Ford 
motor company. You know, the Ford logo is a type of soft asset. You can't really touch it, feel it, or anything like that, but it carries, it's worth something, isn't it? How about intellectual property? Again, you can't really touch it or feel it, but it's there. It's real. Patents, trademarks, copyrights, you know, these are the types of things that, you know, in the accounting world would be called soft assets, or at least for your business. Some people even consider things like, you know, paper assets like stocks and bonds to be soft assets. And relative to the hard asset of, say, gold, something that's physical or real estate, then you would say, well, yeah, you know, that would make sense. So a soft asset would be something that, you know, is just is just something that you really can't touch um, in the same way that doesn't really have that intrinsic value, so to speak. So these are, uh, you know, when you think about these types of soft assets, they're clearly not physical or tangible types of assets. All right, so with that foundation laid, let's consider a few examples of hard assets because there are there are many different ones to consider. So when I think of hard assets, I often think of the acronym that we taught and we teach our members here, and I talked about in my book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, and we even have uh, a model portfolio based upon this concept, this acronym called PACE, P-A-C-E. Now, PACE is a real simple way to remember uh, many types of hard assets, and it's an acronym. So P stands for precious metals, A stands for agriculture, uh, C stands for commodities, and E stands for energy. Now, that's not the that doesn't encompass every single hard asset, but it certainly includes many of them. So precious metals, let's start with the P. Precious metals would be things like gold, silver, palladium, and platinum, right? These are metals that you can hold in your hand. I mean, these metals are tangible, right? They're not intangible. They're tangible, and they can be held. They are palpable. They are concrete. Uh so precious metals would certainly be one type of hard asset. Another type of hard asset, as we mentioned, would be agriculture. But let's also talk about commodities and energy. Let's just lump them all together. These are products that are derived from the earth, you know, just like precious metals. And these are natural resources. So they can include things like corn and wheat and oil, natural gas, and on and on. So commodities are tangible. That is, they can be touched or seen, and they have intrinsic value, right, when you have a barrel of oil, you know, the value is inside the barrel. It is the, the value is in the stuff itself, right? It doesn't represent some sort of value like a stock or a bond. It is the value. Uh, the same thing with gold, right? When you hold a piece of gold in your hand, it doesn't represent some sort of value that's somewhere else. No, no, no. Instead, that value is held in your hand, in that piece of gold. So, Again, commodities, uh, energy, agriculture, you know, precious metals, all of these are examples of hard assets. And then you have uh, one of my favorite types of hard assets, and that is real estate. So whether it's residential property, whether it's industrial property, a multifamily you know, residential property, or even farmland or raw land, you know, virtually all types of real estate are considered to be a hard asset after all. Real estate is tangible, right? It can be seen. It can be touched with your hand. So real estate clearly is an example of hard asset. But real estate and precious metals and agriculture and commodities and energy, that's not all. That's not the only, uh, those are not the only types of hard assets. You also have a variety of other things that I would probably just place underneath the uh, title of collectibles. So this is a unique type of hard asset that includes items like art, uh, which we've seen a big revival of with the NFT market, like the non-fungible token market, which just kind of was made like a hand in a glove for the art market uh, because art is so, you know, uh, it's not fungible. In that case, you know, you, that really works out. So art is a really interesting type of hard asset that you can own in your portfolio. Now, you really got to know what you're doing, right? Art is not something you just just run into and rush into and suddenly become an expert at. You can take years and years to learn the art market. Then you have stamps. You know, stamps, I remember when I was a kid, I was fascinated with stamps and also rare coins, right? I used to collect rare coins when I was a kid. Now, that's a very tough market, right? Very tough market. It's very difficult. You got to learn a lot. There's a lot to learn. But those can really be held in your portfolio as hard assets because, again, they hold 
the worth in themselves. They are tangible. You can touch them. You can feel them, right? You can see them with your eyes. They're real. Fine wine. This is one that's fascinating to me. I really think that fine wine is a very interesting market. You know, there's certain years, certain vintages, certain vineyards that are very popular uh, with investors. And you can buy fine wine and hold it in your portfolio, right? And it grows over time. Another one that might be surprising, but certainly many people certainly approach this type of hard asset for their portfolio are things like classic cars. You know, it's always said that when you buy a car, you know, as soon as you drive it off the lot, buy a brand new car, you know, you lose like 30% or whatever. But there are some cars that actually go up in value, not down, right? So typically I would look at a, at a vehicle and say, well, you know, that's a, that's a depreciating asset. You know, it's, it doesn't go up. It's not like a piece of real estate that goes up over time. But when you're talking about a classic car, then you're talking about something else. There are some vehicles that go up in value over time. And so if you're into that, if you know that market, then that can be a great hard asset for you to invest in, in addition to, you know, stocks and bonds and uh, all the other things that you might invest in, right? Real estate. You want to find these niche markets uh, if you're into it and you can have, you know, more hard assets in your portfolio. Another type of a collectible or another type of, and this might even be more of a natural resource, are gemstones, right? So rubies and sapphires and even diamonds. You know, these are compact and highly portable. So many people will hold their wealth, a, por a portion of their wealth, of course, in things like gemstones. So you can see there's many different types of hard assets, but what do they all have in common? You can see them, you can touch them, you can feel them, right? They're palpable, they're concrete. And perhaps most importantly, their value is intrinsic to themselves. That is, the value is stored inside of them. Their value is inside of the actual object itself. The oil is inherently valuable because of what it is. The piece of gold is in intrinsically valuable because of what it is. The classic car is intrinsically valuable, right? It's not a piece of paper. It's an actual vehicle that has value in and of itself. There's value. Even if you decided it didn't have investment value, you could still go drive it. It would provide that type of value too. There's intrinsic value. So, okay, so that kind of gives you some examples. I probably have not exhausted every possible hard asset, but you get the picture. There's many different types, and I've laid out kind of the, the way to tell what a hard asset is. It's tangible, right, as opposed to being intangible. So why hard assets? What are the advantages of investing in hard assets? So I think the primary reason that I personally invest in hard assets, and probably you do too, is for diversification, right? So we live in this paper economy, and many of the investments that people own today, aside from their own home, are intangible, right? They're soft assets, if you will. Things like stocks and other paper assets, right? These things don't really have intrinsic value. This is always shocking to people, but when you think about it, when you like pull out a dollar bill out of your wallet, you know, you look at that and you say, what's the intrinsic value for this, right? And the only reason why that has value is because people ascribe value to it. They believe that it has some sort of value. But when you think about it, it's just a piece of paper. It's no different than any other piece of paper except for the faith that people have in it. Now, that's different from, say, a classic car, right, as a hard asset. The classic car you actually can get some sort of, derive some sort of value from it. You can drive it around, right? You can get satisfaction from driving it around. What can you get satisfaction from a piece of paper? I mean, you can use it as wallpaper, right? You can draw on it, maybe. You can, you know, we, maybe you can do a little bit of artwork on it. I mean, what are you going to do with a piece of paper? So it's really, when you think about it, paper assets don't really have intrinsic value, they have value that is ascribed to them by the faith that we have in the system, right? Now, that may be different with stocks. You know, stocks do have a backing. You know, these are pieces of paper that are backed up by real companies that are making real money and are making real profits, hopefully. And in that case, well, then you do have a slice of ownership in something that is real. But nonetheless, again, as you can see, these are not really tangible assets. These are largely paper assets. And that's what the majority of people own, what they've been taught to own. So the value of these intangible assets are largely dependent upon the value of many things, but especially the national currency, right? So in our case, if you live in the United States, the United States dollar. 
And if you have a currency devaluation, then the value of many paper assets could decline significantly. However, hard assets will always have that intrinsic value. For example, real estate, gold, and other types of hard assets enjoy that intrinsic value. That is, there's an essential value that belongs naturally to a home. There are few scenarios that can be imagined that would take away the value of a home, right? You may see the price go down over time. You may see the price go up over time. But to say that this thing is no longer worth anything, no. How about land? You know, land, when have we seen land just completely lose its value? I mean, there are times, I guess you could have some sort of natural disaster or some sort of, you know, ecological disaster on that land and ruin it. But aside from these extreme examples, land, you know, is intrinsically valuable and it always will be. Precious metals st or gemstones for that matter. You know, these things have intrinsic value. Now, in my own case, hard assets like gold and silver and land and diamonds compose 15% of my total investment portfolio. So when you look at my overall investing dollars, and I share this with our members all the time, but, you know, and we adjust this occasionally. But right now, you know, when you look at my investment portfolio, 15 cents out of every investable dollar that I have is going into hard assets. So gold, right now it's mainly gold, silver, land, and diamonds. And diamonds is something new. In fact, that's what we're going to be talking about today with Tom Cloud. I'm kind of excited about adding diamonds to my hard asset portfolio. It's a new thing for me. I've known about diamonds for a long time. They're super portable. They're compact. They make a lot of sense. But the, the market was, I couldn't quite understand the market. So I tended to stay away from, you know, I would tend to stay away from things I don't understand. And that's changed a little bit in recent times. So we'll be talking about diamonds in a minute. But anyway, 15% of my total investable portfolio are in things like this, right? Hard assets. Now, I have another 40% of my portfolio, which I focus upon real estate. So that's, again, that's another hard asset. So when you really add it all up, I guess about 55% of my investable assets are going into things that people would consider to be hard assets, right? And I, I'm comfortable with that. I would rather have more than 50% of my investable dollars going into hard assets than going into soft assets, I guess, for lack of a better word. With all that said, there are a few things you should know about hard assets, because I want to bring Tom Cloud on to talk about diamonds. But before we do, I want to talk about just a few things that you should know about hard assets. So number one, uh, in conclusion here, many hard assets are prone to boom bust cycles. You should just know this. Take real estate, for example. Everybody knows that housing prices can rise during some cycles and then fall in others. Right now, we're seeing a huge boom in real estate prices. And that's largely dependent upon the interest rates and the liquidity and uh, you know of the, the amount of uh, money that can be loaned and all of this. And right now, and right now we're seeing a huge boom in real estate, right? But then at other times, and many people have lived through busts in real estate. The last one we had was back in 2008. Many parts of the country saw big declines in the price of real estate. So, you know, that happens in hard assets. So too, other hard assets like commodities, they can balloon in price, right? During some economic cycles. And then they will deflate in price with the next cycle. So you should know that hard assets don't just rise, right? There, no asset just rises all the time. You know, everything is prone to some cycles. They may not dip as much. And in fact, some commodities don't suffer the same type of calamitous collapses that we have seen, for example, in stocks. You know, people tend to think of stocks as a scary asset sometimes because they can. We've seen the Great Depression and the 2008 crash and the 1973 crash, the dot-com bubble. And so, you know, you can see some rapid collapses in the stock market. Well, you just need to know that hard assets can also suffer from boom and bust cycles. It's just something that happens. And then let me make one other point here about hard assets, and that is that hard assets have historically offered inflation protection. So in our era of funny money, monetary debasement, it's important to include assets in our investment portfolio that can protect our purchasing power. That's really the goal here of protecting the purchasing power that you have from the eroding power or effects of inflation. And historically, many hard assets have enjoyed a strong correlation with inflation, meaning that the value of hard assets tend to 
increase in times of rising inflation. Again, real estate values have been surging in recent months right along with rising inflation. So too, if you look at you know, the year-to-date returns of many different asset types in 2021, for example, commodities have been one of the very best returning asset classes this year amid rising inflation. Oil prices have done great. Uh, many uh, raw commodities have done wonderful, right? So again, you will see that they tend to outperform in times where you do have inflation. Now, you may be asking, so how can I get started in, ass- in hard asset investing? Well, let me just tell you how I got started in conclusion here is I got started in, in investing in hard assets by adding them to my own portfolio. I started small. I started by buying physical gold and physical silver, right? I remember buying my very first piece of silver when silver was trading for about $4, 4 or $5, it feels like four fifty, And I, I was enamored with the idea that you could actually buy something that was physical, right? Because I was interested in the stock market and all of these things. But this was early on. This was early 2000s, maybe the late 1990s. I can't remember exactly when I bought my first piece of silver. But so I got started with gold and silver. I remember I bought a very my very first silver bar. I bought, believe it or not, at a garage sale. That's how I actually got started in silver. I was at a garage sale and this guy had a piece of silver and it was all wrapped up and it looked really neat. I thought it was going to be real expensive. I went up to him and I asked him how much it was and he said a dollar. I said, you got to be kidding. And he had like two of them. So I bought two of these, you know, pieces of silver. And I thought these are going to be worth it a lot. I took them immediately down to the pawn shop, you know, just to find out what they would be worth. I knew the pawn shop would probably sell gold or silver. And they said, well, they would give me four or five dollars for them. And it turned out actually that, you know, it was probably a little bit more than that at the time, the actual spot price, because the pawn shop's not going to give you exactly what the spot price is, of course. But uh, yeah, so that's how I got started. And I really was, uh, you know, pleased with that. So I began buying gold and silver. And then, you know, I would buy silver rounds, silver bars, uh, physical gold coins. And then next, I began focusing by adding some other types of hard assets. I began adding residential real estate, residential rental real estate. So I began buying real estate. And then most recently, those have really been my two major hard assets. I've been looking at things like fine wine. I think that's a really neat market. Uh, as I had mentioned, I've also looked at a few other hard asset classes, but I haven't taken the plunge. But then most recently, uh, this year, I began buying physical gemstones, uh, specifically diamonds to my portfolio. And I bought them from Tom. I'm always on the lookout for hard assets that I can include in my portfolio. And as I stated, I'll just repeat this one more time, is that I have about 15% invested specifically in hard assets and another 40% invested in residential real estate. So about 55% of my investment portfolio is exposed to hard assets. I allocate only 20% of my investment dollars to the stock market and the bond market. Um, it, it, largely because I have, I really have more of an affinity and desire to own real estate. So I like stocks. Obviously, I own them, and I certainly trade them as well. But they don't consume the vast majority of my investment portfolio. And then about 5% I allocate to cryptocurrencies. So anyway, so that kind of gives you an idea of where hard assets at least fit into my portfolio. And that doesn't mean that's what it should be for you, but it kind of gives you an idea of how someone you know does it. So over the years, I found that one of the most important keys to investing success is found in allocation, right? That's how you spread out your investment dollars. Every individual has their own temperament for risk. Everyone. So therefore, I think it's best for individuals to sit down and consider what types of assets they feel comfortable owning and which ones they do not feel comfortable owning, and then to go from there. So this conversation is even better in the presence of a wise financial counselor. So there you have it. Hard assets 101. Hard asset investing 101. Hard assets can be a great way to diversify your investment portfolio. And I hope you found today's segment on this topic not only educational, but also inspirational. So after this break, I'm going to be joined by Tom Cloud to continue this discussion on hard asset investing. Stay tuned for that. And follow the money returns after this. Are you prepared for the next stock market crash? It's not too late to protect yourself and your family with Jerry Robinson's best selling book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, now in a new audiobook format. 
whether you want to listen in the car, at the gym, or on your iPad, we've got you covered. Get the entire 300-page book in audio format for only $24.95. That's over 12 hours of Jerry Robinson's economic wisdom, financial insights, and practical money-making strategies for only $24.95. Inside this new audiobook, you'll learn 21 profitable income streams you can create both now and in retirement, along with unique tips on how to inflation-proof your investment portfolio using our own PACE philosophy and our five levels of financial freedom, which is Jerry Robinson's personal blueprint for building true wealth. If your goal is to become a better investor, increase your income, or just understand what is really happening in the global economy, you cannot afford to miss out on the vital information that is jam-packed into this 12-hour audio book. Get instant access to Bankruptcy of Our Nation in audio format right now by going online to www.ftmdaily.com slash bankruptcy. That's ftmdaily.com slash bankruptcy. Download your copy today and get on the fast track to true wealth and a lifetime of financial security. Hi friends, it's Jerry Robinson here from Follow the Money Radio. Do you want to learn how to trade options? Are you intimidated by options trading but still have a desire to learn how it all works? If so, you will be pleased to know that our options trading course is now on sale in our online store for only $37, but for a very limited time. When you purchase this five-hour online video course, you will learn how to leverage the power of options to generate a steady stream of income from the markets while minimizing risk. This course, which is deeply discounted for a limited time, provides you with eight full-length video lessons with me that will walk you step-by-step on how to get started in the world of trading options. This video course begins with a comprehensive introduction to key options trading concepts, including calls and puts, premiums, volatility, along with an introduction to option Greeks and how to properly value an option before you make a trade. But this video course not only introduces you to the basic concepts of options trading, it also provides you with three proven option trading strategies, including how to rent out the stocks that you already own to others to generate a passive income by selling covered call options. We'll also teach you a smart way to buy call options for profits, and our students have told us that the secrets revealed in this video alone are worth the price of the entire options trading course. You'll also learn a unique options trading strategy where you can get paid while you wait to buy your favorite stock. This is an advanced trading strategy that is one of our favorites among our top trading students. So this options trading course contains a tremendous amount of knowledge jam-packed into five full hours of video presentations that you will want to watch over and over again as you begin or continue your trading journey. If your goal is to learn how to make money with options, this is a must-have education video series. And you can unlock this entire video course right now by simply going to followthemoney.com forward slash shop. There you'll find our online store and simply look for the options trading course. This is a special introductory price and it is a limited time offer. So act now. Go to followthemoney.com forward slash shop and take advantage of our deeply discounted options trading course today. All right, friends, welcome back to the program. Great to have you here on Follow the Money Radio. You can find us online at followthemoney.com. And as I had told you before, on the backside, on the last segment, we had said that we were going to be bringing on our good friend Tom Cloud. He's been a longtime sponsor here at Follow the Money Radio, going all the way back more than a decade. Many of you know Tom Cloud. You've talked to him. He has helped you with gold. He's helped you with silver. Hard assets we're talking about today. We've long taught the importance of adding hard assets to one's investment portfolio. And today we're going to be joined, as I mentioned, by our good friend Tom Cloud to talk further about hard assets as an investment asset class. Tom, it's great to be joined by you today. Thank you so much for joining us on the line. Well, Jerry, it's always a pleasure. I like your listeners because they're all educated and that makes 
my job a lot easier. Well, thank you for that. I know they appreciate your insights. And, you know, I think, Tom, this is something interesting because many of our members and our students, but also just listeners to the podcast over the years have heard you provide regular ongoing updates for precious metals, right? Your precious metals market update is extremely popular with our listeners. And over time, you know, people have come to know you, Tom, as a gold and silver expert. That's what you are. You've been in the business, you know, for, you know, a long time. But what many people people may not know is that you've actually been in another business for longer than you've been in gold and silver. Tell us about the other business that you have that's not gold and silver. Well, Jerry, it's, it's diamonds. And uh, back in 1975, a year before I started the gold and silver company, I had started um, diamonds and actually was looking at them a lot as a distribution to the wholesale network and the distribution you know, out there to jewelry stores that had to buy them. And I never could uh, come around to sell them as investments because the pricing was so opaque. And, you know, if you bought a jewelry store one day, a ring for 5000 and needed your money back a month later, you might get 2500 Well, I can't call that an investment, of course. So the diamond business up until right now and we'll be doing detail about this later in a webinar but um, we're, we're now talking about you know diamonds as an important part of an investment uh, portfolio so that company is actually like i said a year older than my gold and silver company and finally it's turned from a, a jewelry supply and company to an investment company so we're excited about that too that's huge and when we were talking off of the air you know you've sold millions of dollars of physical diamonds over the years but what i want to go back to what you just pointed out is the fact that the diamond business and gemstones in you know in particular you know that's a tough space for investors because you do have that extreme illiquidity. I mean, it's one thing to go buy a gold bar and then figure out where am I going to sell this? I mean, you obviously make a market for that. And there is a market right. for ETFs and things like that. But when you talk about diamonds, here you have a market that's a very tough space for investors. It seems to be illiquid up until this point that we're talking about now. You also have these large bid and ask spreads. So like you said, you may buy a diamond for this price, but then how are you going to get your money back immediately? And there's very little price transfer. Transparency. So that's really what you're saying is that the diamond business in general has just sw switched from a jewelry supply to an investment type of business. And I got to admit, I was one of your very first customers. I, I bought diamonds. I, you know, I think anytime you can find an asset, a hard asset that you can use to diversify your portfolio, it can be wise. Not always. It's probably not for everybody. But for me, as soon as I saw what you had presented to me, I knew that diamonds made sense for me. Are your other clients seeing the benefit of investing in diamonds as well? They are, Jerry, and, and there's, there's a lot of reasons. But besides the opaqueness and the wide bid and ask prices, you know, historically they even consider an investment. But now, all of a sudden, this thing, not only that, every diamond that comes out uh, has two certificates, the GIA and the, the GCAL, which are the two top in the world. There's not one of the, some of these uh, grading systems that grade real lenient to help the jewelry industry out and uh we're not talking about that we're talking about triple x diamonds which in itself is a very small percentage of all the diamonds that are cut annually so you're going to say that every diamond is cut identical now whether it's a half a carat one carat two carats it all looks just alike it's all a perfect dispersion of it and that's the reason it can trade as a homogeneous product uh, and, and it's, it's just amazing to see you put these things on the open C network and sell them as an NFT. You can take delivery and wear them. But the reason, the other reason it makes sense, you know, right now is it's so confidential. It's so portable. We got a client who had a million dollars worth of diamonds in his hand. He went by New York to look at some diamonds. There's no way he could see them. So he went by, he took a picture with his cell phone. He had about a million four in, in the palm of his hand. It, it wasn't even a third of his hand. So when you got things like that, the portability, confidentiality, now liquid anywhere in the world if it's on this system that, that I introduced to you. So yeah, that's important because you still got in this network hard assets. You still got gold and silver um, that have the lowest spreads to get in and out. Diamonds is right about the same. 
but uh, yeah, gold and silver and and uh, diamonds are all liquid items that uh, we are are now selling. We're doing it through a different company than NNA that y'all buy your gold and silver from, but it's still uh, one of my companies. So anyway, it's exciting, and uh, the response has been unbelievable, Jerry. It's just but just for uh, some not even a week introduced to the world six to five days ago. It's uh, my phone has been ringing, and there's been some significant purchases already by people but i stand here and, and always glad to talk and, and get into details but hopefully your listeners will visit icecap.diamonds that's i-c-e-c-a-p dot diamonds you know about the gold and the silver and so we're not putting that off the back burner that's going to continue to be uh, a big deal is to have probably in hard assets they're probably the first two investments uh, clients buy and then now i think the diamonds will be close behind them yeah gold is that foundation for your for your hard assets that's where i got started i started with gold moved into silver uh real estate you know land and diamonds is the newest addition that i've made to the hard assets and like you said the idea of the compact extreme portability of diamonds makes them very attractive i mean if you own you know one or two million dollars worth of gold that's heavy you know, that's very heavy, and you're going to have to have it somebody store that. But whenever you have, you know, $1 million or $2 million worth of diamonds, like you said, that's extremely light. You're talking about another feature, another benefit of a hard asset that many assets just can't boast. I really liked also the fact when I bought the diamond from you that I had the choice. I could either have it stored in a vault or I could have, as you had mentioned, send it here. We'll let Jennifer wear it and it'll grow in value over time. And then eventually when it's time to maybe liquidate or to sell it, we can sell it 10, 20 years from now. And I would imagine it'll be worth more. Talk briefly about the value of diamonds over time. Diamonds, people know that gold goes up in times of inflation. Silver tends to go up in times of inflation. And over time, it holds the value of your money. But what about diamonds? Do diamonds go up in value over time? Well, uh, you know, we did a graph, and we'll have this graph on the, we do the webinar on October 6th. Uh, we'll have a graph that shows the comparison. It's mind-boggling to look over 50 years and see how close they trailed each other. You've got gold that started at 42 and now up in 1750 to 1800 here in the last few days, and you've had silver go from $2 all the way up to 50 once. It's sitting in the 22s right now, but Diamonds have not had the 90% jump years or, or double years that gold and silver have had like 1980 and 2011. We haven't seen that in diamonds yet, but you also haven't seen the down years as much. But when it's all said and done, if you said the overall return on a, a gold per year over 40 years, uh, I think it's something like 13%. Uh, diamonds would be about two-thirds of that probably, and we'll have all that on the graph. On the uh, as we go through the webinar on October 6th. Yeah, Tom is referring to the upcoming webinar. This, it's a completely free webinar to all of you who are listening. You can simply go to followthemoney.com forward slash free webinar. And when you get there, there'll be a little form. You just enter your name and your email and click submit or whatever the button says there. I think it says register. And when you click that, what it's going to do is it's going to send you the email link so that you can join that free webinar. And at this webinar, we're, it's going to be a brief webinar, but we're just going to be talking more in depth about investing in diamonds and specifically how it works. So if this is new to you, you definitely don't want to miss this webinar. Tom's going to be showing many different charts and graphs and talking about how diamonds as an asset class have worked out for people over the years and explain where this market could be going. I mean, it is pretty exciting to see, Tom, the fact that this this market, which has been largely illiquid for some time, as you've stated, is now being kind of revolutionized by blockchain technology. It's it's really quite exciting. Uh, and I would imagine that any time a, a market becomes more liquid, then you tend to get more liquidity in that market. And I would imagine that's probably going to just push in more demand uh, against that finite supply of diamonds that could, we could see a, a price surge in diamond prices just because of this new demand that is now, you know, so easy. It's so easy to buy one now for ingredients. It's ground, it's, yeah. It is ground floor opportunity. I mean, it's uh, you'll never see because what will eventually happen, we bring that diamond to market, you know, a, a diamond's found in South Africa, Russia, Argyle mines down in Australia, and those, that's called the rough. And then when you, they, they sell it to a, 
to cutters around the world based on different credit lines they have, and they leave the cutter. They know almost exactly what the cutter's going to make because they've preformed the diamonds they've sold. So what's exciting about it, you're going to have these diamonds cut. All of them cut alike. Now, the colors will be different. There's six different colors, D, E, F, G, H, I, and five different clarities, how free of inclusions it is. But the diamond cut is exactly the same, which gives it the homogeneity to, to be a currency. It, it's fungible. It can be traded for any currency you want. And we're opening an office in Dubai uh, October 1st. I won't even get into that. That's a long time away, but I can't even tell you what's all going on over there. The chairman of the company has got to leave next week and be gone for two weeks because we've got some exciting announcements. But I can tell you that this is a, is a big money uh, attraction, but that's crazy. You know, there's going to be half carat stones in the 2000 range, three quarter carat stones, 3,500, 4,000, depending on the color and clarity. So you've got to realize, and then the, the bigger investor, he's buying something. We're all buying something really rare, but the bigger stone gets, the more rare it gets, and the more it sells per carat. Uh, not just uh, exactly what a half carat, four times, and it's much more than four times because. Mm-hmm. Of the rarity, we see the wealthy people looking, I mean, they're, I mean the, the, they feel the state tax is coming back. Uh, they feel the government's now trolling their bank accounts, as I put out last week. People are trying to fight back, and, and we've seen Basel three now going to the gold for a second. We, we've been finding out the reason gold hasn't shot up like it should with Basel three taking effect on June the 1st, where, where central banks can now own gold bars and that are LBMA brands, they can now own those and count them as full value on their quarterly reports and statements to investors on their stock. That And gold's the only thing, not silver, not diamonds, just gold. But now we've been finding out that one of the reasons the price hasn't moved, which everybody thought it would take off back on June the 1st, is the banks tried to get smart like the brokerage firms that are going long and, and short, trying to get people to give their gold away because they know it's going to go to several thousand dollars an ounce before this is all said and done with all this going on in the U.S. and the world. Just, just look at I mean, headlines of the thing today. Republicans are fighting to raise the debt ceiling or keep the debt ceiling from being going up much. And you got Pelosi over introducing a $3.5 trillion infrastructure deal. I mean, this world we live in is going crazy. And without doubt, no doubt in my mind, the thing, all tangible assets are going to do well, but the three we're talking about, gold, silver, and diamonds, will do the best, in my opinion. I mean, we've had a lot of people call in the last week saying, uh, if I liquidate my, my Bitcoin, you know, can I buy the diamonds with it? And the answer is no, we, we can't take Bitcoin. But the point is, they like it because they have the diamond backed up. It's on the blockchain. Everybody can see it. It's not for sale. It sits there until you activate it to sell it. That's where Jerry's is, and that's where mine are. Uh, they're all there, and I'll sit them there, like you said, five, 15 years, and when I'm ready for them, I'll, I'll sell them and activate. They'll go for bid. But here's the last comment on that. The jewelry stores, because right now the diamond comes from the miner to the cutter. To two of, each cutter has two or three super wholesalers, and then there's a, a next li- li- uh, wholesaler list. It's a small guy that calls on small uh, stores and things. And then so you have four or five people that make a profit. We're bringing this straight from the cutter that buys it from the beers and, and bringing it straight to you. We're the only middleman in there. We're, you know, we're making 5% total on the deal. I mean, it, there's nobody in the world doing this. This is the first time in the members are incredible, the, the founders. Yeah, it really seems like a, a, a very novel uh, approach, and I see very good things for it. So we're going to be talking more about diamond investing. So if this sounds interesting to you, say, this is interesting, I may want to consider adding some diamonds to my hard asset portfolio. Never considered that before. Join us for this free webinar, followthemoney.com forward slash free webinar. Bring your questions and be prepared to learn. It'll be a nice, insightful, and educational webinar where you can learn about another asset asset class. That's a possibility for you. It's not for everybody, Tom, right? There's not everybody needs to own diamonds, but some people, it makes a lot of sense. They have a right risk temperament for it. It may make sense for their particular situation. So we're in the final moments here, Tom. We got to go. But uh, for those who want to get a hold of you, talk to you about gold, silver, diamonds, tell us how that works. Well, if, if the gold and silver is best is to call the office um, 800 
247-2812. And we'll be bringing some more news on those markets next week. Um, and then if you want to talk to me about Diamonds Direct, I have a number dedicated to that. It's 912-771-9353. Once again, 912-771-9353. And I will get uh, back to you. My daughter is helping me with this uh, company get get started, and uh, she can talk to you too uh, if she answers. But uh, if you want to get a good education, I'm happy to take the time because I know how important it is and probably no time in my life has been more important to have tangible assets than right now. What percentage is something you have to decide, but we can help you get the right price on the gold, the silver, and the diamond. So I'm available to talk to anyone that wants to talk. Fantastic. I appreciate it, Tom. I sure do uh, look forward to our webinar. For those who want to be a part of that, go to followthemoney.com forward slash free webinar and register now for free to be a part of the webinar all about diamond investing. Tom, great to have you on the line today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate it. As mentioned, Tom Cloud is a longtime sponsor of Follow the Money. And if you are interested in learning more about adding diamonds to your investment portfolio, you can call Tom at 912-771-9353, or you can email him with questions at tomcloud1630 at gmail.com. When you choose to do business with Tom Cloud for diamonds or precious metals, you are supporting the good work that we do here at followthemoney.com. Thanks for your support. drugs, you get drug addicts and drug dealers, but you start to follow the money and you don't know where it's going to take you. All right, friends, welcome back to the program. Hope you've enjoyed today's broadcast. By the way, if you want to be a part of this upcoming live webinar with Tom Cloud and myself, we're going to be talking about diamonds, diamond investing, how that fits into the hard asset portfolio. That date is October the 6th, 2021, and it's going to be held live at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1, 8, 1 p.m. Central and 11 o'clock uh, Pacific Time. So if you'd like to be a part of that, all you have to do is go to followthemoney.com forward slash free webinar, enter your name and your email address, and then you will receive the link to be able to join that webinar live. Today, we've been talking about assets that provide a good return. And I would be remiss if I did not discuss the greatest investment that one can make. It's not an education, though that is very high on my list. Instead, in my opinion, our faith in God and his promises offer the greatest yield because the rewards are not just temporal, but they're eternal. The Bible tells us that Abraham's faith yielded him a return, not only of a son in his old age, but also made him the father of many nations with more descendants than the number of stars in the sky. Faith in Christ's finished work at the cross of Calvary yields eternal life and peace with our heavenly father who created us. So in all of your investing and in wise stewardship, I implore you, don't forget the greatest asset of all is your faith. Don't neglect your faith. The yield that comes from your faith can and will far surpass every other asset you could ever invest in. Don't be satisfied with temporal riches when the true and eternal riches are made freely available to all who will exercise their faith. And that's just something to think about. If you want more information about those true riches, I encourage you to check out our other website and podcast over at truerichesradio.com. There you'll find many podcast episodes and video teachings that have been designed to challenge believers to think more deeply about their faith and to challenge thinkers as to why they should believe. And with that, friends, that brings us to the end of today's episode. I sure hope you found it insightful and useful. As always, remember, when you want the truth, just follow the money. Have a safe and prosperous week, and we'll see you right back here next time. Until then, God bless. All of the 
information contained on the Follow the Money podcast is strictly for informational and educational purposes. It should not be construed as specific investment advice. The views and opinions of our guests and sponsors, including Tom Cloud, are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of FTMDaily.com or Robinson Media Group, LLC. Jerry Robinson does hold an insurance license and at times may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products. Follow-up, individualized responses to email or phone requests that involve the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation will not be made absent compliance with state investment advisor registration requirements or an applicable exemption or exclusion and applicable insurance regulations. Past performance is not indicative of future results. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussion discussed on the podcast. Remember, never do your financial planning through podcast or radio. It's your money. Be wise. Do your due diligence and always consult a trusted financial professional before making any financial decisions.